The breaking news of the day from President Biden came just a few floor below, a few floors below where I'm sitting right now at an ice cream shop where the president shopped after uh, stopping by the to taping the Seth Meyers show. And that took place a few floors above where I'm sitting right now in the ice cream shop, which the president could not pass up before getting in his motorcade and unlocking the gridlock traffic in Midtown Manhattan by leaving. The president said he is negotiating a ceasefire in Gaza that he hopes will be in force next Monday. We're close. We're close. We're not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. The president also confirmed in the ice cream shop that he's going to travel to the southern border in Texas on Thursday. He said he planned that trip before the White House knew that Donald Trump also plans to go to the southern border on Thursday, 350 miles away from where President Biden will be in Brownsville, Texas. Oh, and Joe ordered mint chip, and Seth ordered honeycomb. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi. <laughs> See you guys. Hi, you like you. ice cream too? Yeah. Sorry, no more ice cream. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You're in for a treat. Oh, right. So you listed up there. Yeah. Pretty good when you're the president of the United States, and you're known for two things: great man, sunglasses, and ice cream. There you go. <laughs> no better combo. <laughs> Is. We've got mint chip, we've got coffee avocado. How about mint chip? Mint chip, you got it. And how about the sugar? Sugar cone? Yeah. Okay. I was worried you were going to be that guy who asked for all the samples. <laughs> <laughs> we can get you some samples. By the way, I'm the last of the big spenders in the East, so I can put whatever he's at. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I'll well, do that a honeycomb. Honeycomb? Yeah. Would you like that on a waffle cone? Sugar cone? You got it. You got it. While Joe Biden was happily mixing with the people of New York and making news around the world from an ice cream shop on 6th Avenue, five blocks away from where Donald Trump used to live, the people of the state of New York were crushing Donald Trump in court. The people of the state of New York against Donald J. Trump defendant is the official name of the criminal case that District Attorney Alvin Bragg is prosecuting against Donald Trump, which will be the very first criminal trial that Donald Trump has to go through beginning on March 25th. It is the trial in which Trump supporters might get to listen to the under oath testimony of porn star Stormy Daniels explaining how and why Donald Trump paid her $130,000 during his first presidential campaign to keep his adventures with Stormy Daniels secret in a deliberate deception intended to deceive American voters about Donald Trump before they voted in 2016. Having watched enough of defendant Trump's antics in various courtrooms, including mostly New York City courtrooms, District Attorney Alvin Bragg has seen enough. He filed a 331-page motion for a gag order on defendant Trump in that case. The motion says, to protect the integrity of this criminal proceeding and avoid prejudice to the jury, the people respectfully request that this court issue a narrowly tailored order restricting certain prejudicial extrajudicial statements by defendant. Defendant has a long history of making public and inflammatory remarks about the participants in various judicial proceedings against him, including jurors, witnesses, lawyers, and court staff. Those remarks, as well as the inevitable reactions they incite from defendants, followers, and allies, pose a significant and imminent threat to the orderly administration of this criminal proceeding. The motion offers voluminous evidence of the danger Donald Trump poses to everyone involved in the case, including witnesses and jurors. The motion seeks to restrict Trump comments about the prosecutors, but it specifically does not include District Attorney Alvin Bragg himself as someone Donald Trump would not be allowed to talk about. District Attorney Bragg has deliberately not asked the court to protect him from Donald Trump's threats. 
A five-page affidavit appears toward the end of the motion. It's easy to miss that affidavit for most of the news media discover, describing the contents of this motion. It begins with the name of the person filing this affidavit, and the next sentence says, I am a sergeant in the New York Police Department. Since January of 2022, I have served as the commanding officer of the security detail of New York County District Attorney Alvin Bragg. I monitor threats in coordination with the NYPD's Threat Assessment and Protection Unit, a unit within the NYPD's Intelligence Bureau. In 2022, Threat Assessment and Protection Unit logged 483 threat cases. Of the 483 threat cases, one involved threats to the district attorney, his family, or his employees. So, the year before Alvin Bragg prosecuted Donald Trump, he got only one of the 483 credible threats issued to New York City officials. The affidavit continues. In 2023, Threat Assessment and Protection Unit logged 577 threat cases. Of the 577 threat cases, 89 involved threats to the district attorney, his family, or his employees. In 2023, the first threat case involving the district attorney, his family, or his employees was logged on March 18th, 2023. Here is what happened on March 18th, 2023. Donald Trump announced on social media that he, quote, will be arrested on Tuesday by District Attorney Alvin Bragg. The affidavit continues. By March 20th, 2023, the volume of threatening, harassing, or offensive calls and emails increased significantly, exceeding the capacity of the DA office investigators and NYPD detectives detailed to the DA's office. Starting on March 20th, 2023, all such calls and emails were forwarded directly to Threat Assessment and Protection Unit for review and assessment. Since the DA took office on January 1st, 2022 through mid-March of 2023, none of the threats received required referral for further investigation in partnership with a prosecutor's office. In the three weeks following March 18th, 2023, several threats were received that ultimately were referred for further investigation in partnership with a prosecutor's office. One public example of a threat during that time period is documented in the felony complaint in People versus Craig DeLu Robertson. The complaint details that on or about March 18th, 2023, the defendant did knowingly transmit in interstate commerce a communication containing a threat to injure the person of another, the New York County District Attorney Alvin Bragg, to it. Alvin Bragg, heading to New York to fulfill my dream of eradicating another of George Soros' two-butt political hack DAs. I'll be waiting in the courthouse parking garage with my suppressed Smith & Wesson M&P 9mm to smoke a radical fool prosecutor that should never have been elected. I want to stand over Bragg and put a nice hole in his forehead with my 9mm and watch him twitch as a drop of blood oozes from the hole as his life ebbs away to hell. Bye-bye to another corrupt bastard. That is what one Trump supporter wrote to Alvin Bragg the day that Donald Trump announced that he would soon be indicted by Alvin Bragg. The affidavit refers to more than 600 emails and phone calls received at the DA's office that were threatening. A small sample is included in the affidavit. March 19th, 2023, leave Trump alone or Bragg will get assassinated. March 19th, 2023, just shoot Bragg in the head and he stops being a problem. March 21st, 2023, if you lay a hand on President Trump or his family, friends, supporters, or myself, my family, or any patriot, instant death. March 22nd, 2023, just watched, just wanted to say, I can't wait to watch you swing from a rope in your military tribunal. You're a disgusting George Soros puppet effing money will get you nowhere. You better get on your knees and pray to Jesus Christ. You're going to find your maker soon. We have every reason to believe that that is exactly what Donald Trump was hoping for when he announced he would soon be indicted by Alvin Bragg. Donald Trump has also attacked the judge in this case who has to decide whether to impose a gag order on Donald Trump. Donald Trump has also attacked the judge's family. 
Donald Trump's lawyers tried to pursue their appeal in New York today of the $83 million jury verdict against, uh, against Donald Trump in the E. Jean Carroll lawsuit that accused Donald Trump of rape. But Donald Trump's lawyers tried to do it on the cheap, which Judge Lewis Kaplan did not allow. Judge Kaplan filed a short order saying Mr. Trump has moved for an administrative stay of enforcement pending the filing and disposition of any post-trial motions that he may file. He seeks that relief without posting any security. The court declines to grant any stay, much less an unsecured stay, without first having afforded plaintiff a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Plaintiff shall make any response to the defendant's motion no later than 5 p.m. on February 29th. Any reply shall be filed no later than 5 p.m. on March 2nd. Special Prosecutor Jack Smith has responded to the Trump criminal defense lawyers claiming that Donald Trump is the victim of selective prosecution in the Florida case where he is accused of violations of the Espionage Act and illegal possession of documents. Donald Trump's lawyers say that other former officials, including Joe Biden, after he left the vice presidency, have possessed some classified material and were not prosecuted. One of the necessary elements of a claim of selective prosecution is identifying a case where there was no prosecution, but it is so close in every way to the case being prosecuted that it shows that the prosecutors unfairly decide who is allowed to commit this crime and who gets prosecuted. Jack Smith's response says, the defendants have not identified anyone who has engaged in a remotely similar suite of willful and deceitful criminal conduct and not been prosecuted, nor could they. Indeed, the comparators on which they rely are readily distinguishable. For example, their primary comparator is Joseph R. Biden, whose conduct is described in the recently issued report by Special Counsel Robert K. Hur. But as the Hur report itself recognizes, several material distinctions between Mr. Trump's case and Mr. Biden's are clear. Most notably, Trump unlike Biden, is alleged to have engaged in extensive and repeated efforts to obstruct justice and thwart the return of documents bearing classification markings, and the evidence concerning the two men's intent, whether they knowingly possessed and willfully retained such documents, is also starkly different. There have been many government officials who have possessed classified documents after the ends of their terms in office often inadvertently, sometimes negligence, negligently, and very occasionally willfully. There have also been a very small number of cases in which former government officials who have been found in possession of classified documents have briefly resisted the government's lawful efforts to recover them. But there has never been a case in American history in which a former official has engaged in conduct remotely similar to Trump's. It's so fascinating that this situation in Alabama has illuminated what Republicans have actually been up to in the Senate and the House uh, for a while now. Well, I mean, that's exactly right. And we know, I mean, actions speak louder than words. This is what my mother taught me, and it is just as true today as it was when she first told it to me. You can see by their actions that they are hell-bent to ban abortion, and they can't walk away from what their past actions have been when it comes to banning in vitro, uh, in, in vitro fertilization. And as you just went through, there's so many examples of how they have said basically our judgment, our, our judges, our politicians should be the ones deciding what happens to women's bodies and their lives. And I mean, it's laughable that they think that uh, that they need a message memo to explain to them that Americans want to be able to make these decisions for themselves. But, you know, they don't have a message problem. They have a policy problem that no message memo is going to fix. So uh, on in vitro fertilization, uh, the, the Republicans uh, are, you know, are just now running away from everything they've said, every position they've taken on in the past, because it's only now getting attention. Uh, is, is that basically the manual for campaigning uh, against Republicans this year is simply show the voter what these people, the positions they've actually held? Now, I think that these Republican candidates are dramatically out of step 
with what most Americans believe. Most Americans believe that people should have the freedom to be able to make their own decisions about their own bodies and their own lives. And yet time after time, you've seen um, these extremist Republicans in the House and in the Senate uh, take steps to, uh, to to be on the other side of that. And let's be really clear, too. There is a direct line from Donald Trump all the way through to that um, in vitro decision in Alabama. What he did to stack the U.S. Supreme Court so that they overturned Roe makes it possible for the Alabama Supreme Court to hold that decision that they have uh, just done and the impact that, that has on women in Alabama. So there's no running away from the reality that their actions have put us in the position that we're in today. And that's why in this election, uh, it's going to be so important to help people turn out to make sure that they get the own, they have their own responsibility, their own control over their own bodies. Senator Tina Smith, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, thank Lawrence. You. Professor Snyder, you know, when I was listening to that uh, very tight recitation of Russian history and Russian failures, uh, I was, of course, thinking of you and thinking and wondering, how does the Russian mind process those facts? It, it, in Putin's Russia, those are the facts that are avoided. The, the, the vision of the past that Putin has tried to supply is one in which Russia is simultaneously never defeated and nevertheless always a victim. And this is why it's so helpful to have a good Polish government, a sound government in one of Russia's neighbors, why it's so good to know something about history, because it reminds us that the moments when Russia has actually made good policy choices have been the moments after defeat, after defeat in Crimea, after defeat against Japan. Um, these are the moments when it seemed like something in Russia could change. So we should remember that Russia has been defeated, but also take courage in the thought that Russia ought to be defeated also for the good of Russians. Uh, when you when you hear the, the Polish foreign ministers saying these things, uh, there, there's such a clarity to it that I'm sure everyone there agrees with, and including possibly secretly even members of the Russian delegation, understand that what he's saying is actually true. Of course that's the case. I mean, one of the things which is so refreshing about Foreign Minister Sikorsky's presentation is that he accepts with us that there is truth, that it's it's worth responding to propaganda, not with more propaganda, but with calm recitations of what is going on and what has gone on. And of course, the, when you accept that truth matters, you're also accepting that you're making the truth, that you're taking responsibility for what's happening, that whether Russia wins or doesn't win has something to do with the things that you do. Because when you apprehend the truth, as opposed to listening to propaganda, you begin to think about what you can do and what you should do. And of course, Poland, the Europeans, and the Americans are in a position to do a lot to make sure that this war turns out the right way. How should we be thinking about this war at what is now the two-year mark? We are now the weak link. The Ukrainians have shown that they can do an awful lot with the little that we have given them. Right now, we're giving them nothing. We should be thinking of this as a long war, as a hard war, as a war where the Ukrainians are doing the suffering for us, as a war in which the Ukrainians are maintaining peace elsewhere for us, as a war in which we should be thanking them, and as a war in which we should be doing the things that we can do. All we have to do is supply them with what they need, and then we and they and everyone else will reap the benefits.